politics and security. And today we will deal with a very interesting uh, topic, uh, which is the role of the universities in the crisis, in the international crisis. Uh, the idea of this round table uh, came out from um, a book by Francis Saunders that was published in 2004. That was uh, entitled Struggles for Hearts and Minds in the, during the Cold War and deals with the role of cultural institution in the development of international relations. And given the rise, unfortunately, of several international crises in the most recent years, we thought that maybe um, just re rethink and reassess uh, the role of cultural institutions, especially uh, universities, uh, would be uh, very helpful in order to understand if this role, which is the, this role, and if this role could be somehow improved. Uh, today, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, the um, vice rectors of international relations of the main Italian universities um, that we deal with three different scenarios. Um, the COVID post-emergency, the Afghan, and maybe just um, giving some full for thought, talking about the Ukrainian crisis. So we start immediately introducing um, the Vice Rector for International Relations of the University of Padova, Professor Cristina Basso, who is full professor of pathology at the Department of Cardiac, Thoracic, and Vascular Sciences, at the University of Padova and her research interest has been analyzing uh, the field of cult cardiovascular, this is not my field, so <laughs> cardiovascular medicine, with special reference to anatomical clinical aspect and clinical implication of basic research. Uh, she will give a paper um, dealing with uh, from COVID pandemic to Afghanist crisis and Ukraine. Thank you for joining us and I leave immediately the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Cristina Basso. I just uh, became a vice director for international relations a few months ago, October 1st. As you understand, my background is totally different because I am a doctor, my real doctor, deeply involved during the pandemic for my profession, of course, uh, due to the high mortality of COVID-19 pandemics. But uh, I'm here for another reason. The title is Om Omnicomprehensive because we are moving from uh, the COVID post-emergency to the Afghan and Ukrainian scenarios. And I must admit that uh, when I started this uh, commit new role, this commitment, uh, there was the Afghan crisis uh, set uh, during August, September. And then immediately, a few months later, the Ukrainian, um, of course, um, uh, problem. So uh, not an easy way to, to start a new, <laughs> a new job, a new position. But let me say a few words. Probably COVID is not the main part of the discussion today, but probably the other people will speak more on the Ukrainian and the Afghan um, side. So um, the University of Padua, as many other uh, institutions, did a lot uh, during the COVID pandemics uh, because uh, this um, pandemic has ever disrupted uh, the, the implementation of international activities, uh, for sure. In this context, the University of Padua, as other universities in Italy and around the globe, has the, to review and reorganize its uh, international uh, uh, operation by moving online most of the activities, uh, planning activities, including student mobility, meeting with partners, which is very important for study, for research, for education, international projects, and many other things. And uh, these two years, 2020, 2021, uh, and have been particularly challenging, but uh, at the same time, they gave us the opportunity to test new initiative and a new form of collaboration that uh, hopefully in some way will continue to develop after the conclusion of the pandemic. And we hope that we are close to the conclusion of the pandemic, even though we have to wait for the next autumn. In uh, uh, 2020, our university allocated 13 million to support the university career of students in a period of profound difficulty for many families. And these funds were very important to guarantee students connectivity, which was not at that time, were just at the beginning of this revolution, support the costs related to rent and transport, support the new entry, the matricula and the purchase of a new personal computer, tablet or books, 
There were also some measures related to the payment of university fees. So external exemption for some category, uh, uh, of course, linked to the um, up to 24,000 is a postponement of installment. And then there were additional 16 uh, and a half million investment for the um, postdoctor, the doctorate, the PhD students, um, which were able to extend the duration of the scholarship by two months, with respect to the 36 months. The investment of to modernize the classroom. In recent years, the university has invested also more than 3 million euros to rent a large new classroom and to install live streaming system like the one we are using today, by the way, because even though the pandemic is not anymore here, we're taking profit of the new uh, system to communicate with many people. Uh, if you see how many people are in this room, probably there are many, many, many others connected online. And this is really the added value of the uh, digitalization uh, and uh, the dual uh, communication. Um, then there were also uh, intervention in 2021 um, uh, for accommodation costs to help the many students who did not have the accommodation in Padua at the beginning of the lesson. And I think that this was a, a problem everywhere in Italy because when we were back from the pandemics, many um, apartments disappeared. So the people, the owner started to uh, rebuild, to reconstruct, and so they were not anymore available for the students. This was really an emergency here in Padua because we have not so many, I mean, uh, um, location for students, but most the majority are private uh, uh, apartment. Uh, and so the university decided to reimburse expenses incurred in the period of September, December 2021, um, in accommodation facilities such as hotel, bed and breakfast, up to a maximum daily amount of 50 euros per student, and um, for a maximum amount of 500 euros gross recipient, but again, based upon, of course, the income of these um, students and their family. So there was a, there were the revolution teaching, online session, safety return in person. There were um, also revolution in uh, remote services for students and users. Uh, and also at the same time, uh, the university was thinking about the health and the well-being of people. So organized also uh, fitness uh, courses, uh, online courses uh, uh, to protect the staff, to protect the students. Uh, uh, online psychological uh, listening point for emergency. This is also very important, uh, even though the people were not enough because the demand was really increasing day by day. Um, the caring professional project, uh, Canale Scuola, Consultancy Desk Design for Primary and Secondary School Teachers, uh, Remote Homework Help Program, the pills of psychology again to uh, a weekly appointment with experts from the University of Padua, a local professional, who in 15 minutes will describe some of the central issues that everyone was facing in the emergency period. Uh, so many initiatives, uh, and uh, of course, I think that the same was going on in, in the other university around Italy, and uh, we had to invent ourselves because we were not, uh, of course, prepared to. And so this is a demonstration that when we are facing uh, emergency, we are able to, uh, to do the best uh, to, to help uh, our students, our staff, and also to communicate uh, uh, in the third mission um, uh, level uh, with the uh, people uh, uh, outside. This is also not so um, less important. Uh, I mean, uh, the um, relationship between the university and the territory, this famous uh, third mission, which is very popular nowadays, because our university organizes a lot of communication and events, also describing the problem of COVID pandemics, uh, um, taking uh, uh, into account also the availability of experts in the field, uh, trying to communicate in an easy way uh, the problem that uh, um, is uh, running, of course, uh, um, the new pandemics. During the emergency, new communication channels were opened and created with the university community, including new institutional information section of the UniPD website, both in Italian and English, dedicated to the COVID-19 emergency. Um, the academic community was updated in real time on the communication director and general director, and uh, you know also that we have a very famous and important um, magazine. Um, the university also carried an important action, information action through the Bo Live, 
this is our uh, journal, publishing specific contents dedicated to the national and international evolution of the health emergency, to the impact that this has had in the various fields from the political one, economic, uh, social, and uh, environmental. Uh, by the way, we were forced to organize many events only online, including the, um, uh, I mean, uh, the inauguration of the academic year in 2020, in 2021 was dual, and uh, hopefully this year on uh, May 19, we are going to celebrate the 800th anniversary in presence, even though not all people will be able to enter the, the main uh, Aula Magna, but uh, there will be a connection with the main square here in uh, Padua, uh, Piazza Cavour, projecting the ceremony, and then, of course, YouTube and all the other channels that uh, you know very well. So this is for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So probably we can uh, discuss later on the other aspects uh, just to whoever, what do you think? Well, maybe you could uh, continue. Yeah, continue okay. to develop all the-, the Okay. Yeah, so <clears throat> total different topic uh, for sure, but again, uh, um, something that is happening uh, suddenly, uh, you are not prepared to. First of all, uh, the um, Afghan um, crisis and then uh, the Ukrainian uh, crisis. <clears throat> so we are just uh, um, during the pandemics, but uh, after the second uh, wave of the pandemics, uh, uh, following these two years, 2000 and 2021, uh, while we were uh, uh, slowly, cautiously going back to normal life and normal activity, the Afghan crisis broke, uh, broke out. And in front of the dramatic situation that the Afghan population was facing, the University of Padua uh, promptly reacted to welcome the Afghan refugees. Um, there, there was a famous campaign, UNIPD for Afghanistan. Uh, with this respect, the University of Padua has created a, a dedicated initiative for students wishing to enroll in, um, in a bachelor or master degree at our university. More specifically, we selected 50 Afghan citizens who received a, a 12,000 euro scholarship and a fee waiver to start their studies in October 2021. Among these 50 people, 35 were eventually able to leave the country because this was another problem you plan to have, but the problem is to reach Italy in many places or um, uh, outside Afghanistan. And so 35 eventually came and they are now studying at our university. Uh, nevertheless, this was not enough given the initiative was extremely successful and the application were more than 200 more than 200, the university prompted a fundraising campaign and collected more than 530,000 euro from several private donors. Thanks to this uh, donation, the university prompted a second call for application for 23 scholarship. And as, as today, we received 285 applications. So still ongoing, still people coming, hopefully um, refugee from Afghanistan. As far as the Ukraine, um, the University of Padua did almost the same, uh, uh, developed a similar initiative immediately after the beginning of the war in Ukraine. It was the uh, end of February, uh, beginning of March. We discussed a lot uh, with our colleague, particularly scholar at Rich, this, uh, this problem. I know that uh, we can discuss later on. Starting from March 2022, the University of Padua approved many initiatives to support Ukrainian students and scholars with an overall investment of uh, 910,000 euro. On one side, we are supporting our students with fee waivers and scholarships. And the other, the other side, so students already exist in Padua, waiving the fee. On the other side, we uh, are supporting, so supporting Ukrainian citizens wishing to become our students with two scholarship program. The first one is sponsoring 50 scholarship for an amount of 3,100 euro each for attending single course. This was the emergency decision, uh, probably not so uh, applicable in many, in many instances, but just to provide some possibility to these um, people, young people, for attending single course units during the current academic year, the ongoing, already started. 
while the second one is sponsored with 75 scholarship for 6,200 euro each to attend full degree programs in the next academic year, 2021 through 2023. Moreover, this is for students. Uh, the university is promoting another scholarship program to receive uh, Ukrainian scholars. We debated a lot how to do. Uh, there was also a ministry decision to support the university, not so a big amount of money, it's still there. We don't know where we can use this, uh, this amount, but uh, we decided to go on because we cannot wait. And the research fellowship of maximum 12 months uh, were approved. Uh, the conditions in economy was to be co-financed by the department, 50% the university and 50% the department hosting the scholar. And uh, as of today, the number that I have, uh, we expect to receive uh, 52 students and five scholars, but these figures for sure are going to, to uh, will grow in the, next, uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, these two initiatives, the Afghan uh, crisis in front of the, Afra the Afghan crisis and the uh, Ukraine crisis uh, are not a simple reaction. Uh, uh, I think that they are not occasional and contingent. Uh, uh, you know that the University of Padua, this is not uh, rhetoric, uh, uh, has a long-standing commitment to support students and scholars entitled to receive international protection. Uh, and how I can say this? Uh, because I know, I studied that, uh, um, we can mention some initiative, the University Corridor for Refugees, the Manifesto for an Inclusive University, and the active participation in the scholar at risk networks, as many other universities in Italy and around Europe and the world are, are doing. Unfortunately, uh, the current international scenarios does not suggest, do not suggest uh, imminent um, uh, improvements. Uh, if you look to the media, the newspaper, the interview on, uh, in, the, in the television, on the opposite, the international tension between Europe, US, and Russia and China might hide uh, future and new crises. Uh, if uh, this will be the case, uh, faithful to the tradition, uh, the University of Padua will be on the front line to support student scholars in need uh, in search of protection. Probably we have to move from uh, an EPD for Afghan, an EPD for Ukraine, should be an EPD for refugee, because uh, uh, we don't know what is going on. Hopefully, nothing else. But uh, uh, we are ready, we are ready to, to move. And this is probably an initiative that is not just the University of Padua, but the network of the University in Italy under the CRUI and other initiatives. You know that uh, again, we are celebrating this year the 800 university and the motto this year is free your future. Is a slogan which accompanies all the initiative surrounding the University of Padua 800 anniversary. Words of freedom have carried the university over eight centuries of tradition and ever since its foundation in 1222, when a group of students, professors, left the University of Bologna, <laughs> because it's all there, in search of greater freedom. Why greater freedom? Because here um, there were not the rule of the church. We were free to do, we were free to, to think without any, any link. Um, the immigration led to liberate teaching on legal subjects that had been stifled by political and religious ties, defining Padua as the Universitas Egristaro. So, uh, freedom is synonymous with university identity, drawing inspiration from uh, the motto, the famous motto, Universa Universis Patavina Libertas. Just, just to conclude, because really we think that uh, our main mission is ranking is uh, writing paper, impact factor, many other reasons. But uh, now our main mission is really to help people, to help our colleagues uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. I, I would say more, probably also other people coming from that area because they are now also victim of this war. They are not able to, to pronounce uh, uh, their idea uh, without any restrictions. So we can discuss uh, more about Russia, Belarusia, and many other issues. So um, this is what uh, we did, the University of Padua did, and many other people uh, are doing, uh, trying to help, uh, of course, uh, refugees coming from uh, Afghan and from, uh, and from uh, Ukraine. So.
Thank you so much to Professor Basso. Actually, uh, the Russian side of the story is another important side that should be uh, considered. Uh, and maybe this could be a very good um, hint for the upcoming discussion. Uh, but now I immediately uh, introduce and then leave the, uh, the floor to Professor Raffaella Campaner uh, from the University of Bologna. <clears throat> Raffaella Campaner is full professor of philosophy of science at the University of Bologna, and she's also a life member uh, of the Clare Hall College, Cambridge. And since November 2021, so with a very precise timing, <laughs> she serves as vice rector for international relations at the University of Bologna. Today, she will present uh, a paper dealing with the post-emergency scenario, rethinking education formats and hosting schemes. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here this morning. I'll just ask for help for these slides, which are here. Okay. okay. So thank you so much. Um, a good part of what I will be dealing with has very significant overlaps with what Professor Basso was, was mentioning. So I think that the actions that Uniba took are very, were and are, and probably are going to be quite similar to the ones that Padova uh, Took and he's taken. Uh, I will try to put forward then some thoughts on what we have been doing in Uniba. And then I will try and hopefully it's going to be food for thoughts and for interactions and reflections later on. Um, I will try to reflect with you on whether there are actual, actually some common features uh, between these different kind of crises that we had to face um, and whether there are some common lessons that we can eventually draw to get ready for future challenges, which we hope we will not have to face, but which, again, as Christina was mentioning, might actually be happening. Um, I will just start with a very uh, brief joke. As Christina, I started my mandate on the 2nd of November. Um, before that, I mean, I was appointed director of a master course in Bologna, Laurea Magistrale in Scienze Filosofiche, in November 2019, and then in February the pandemic started, and then I was appointed vice rector in November 2021, and then in February the war started. So my son, who is 12, um, told me, mom, it's a clear sign that you should not take any appointment whatsoever anymore, please don't, don't do that. <laughs> So it was really a very kind of um, hard situation we had to, to face, which uh, I believe has impacted um, in many respects, both internal equilibria and external international ones. And I think that all these three uh, situations are likely to impact for a long time. Um, so on the one hand, they are very different. They, they look very different and they are very different. Um, it's kind of controversial actually whether they were totally unexpected or not. I mean, if you talk with some colleagues in epidemiology, they would tell you that eventually at some point we were expecting something like that would happen. Um, if you talk with colleagues in international sciences, they would tell you that, oh, well, what happened in Afghanistan was to be expected as soon as the uh, intention of leaving Afghanistan uh, on behalf of the US, for instance, something like, like that was, was to be expected, and likewise for Ukraine. So whether we should have been prepared better is a kind of controversial theme, actually. Um, all these things have been impacting very strongly uh, academic institutions with respect to internal core activities. We had to rethink very quickly about teaching, research, and mobility schemes. Um, Second point, which is something which is very, very vividly felt in Bologna. Bologna I mean, I'm not from there and I didn't graduate there and I didn't do my PhD there, uh, but I've been in, in, in Bologna for quite some time. Um, Bologna is a very special place, I believe, in the sense that this city and the university are really, really intertwined. And it is so, most of the times for the best, not always for the best, it's a complicated um, love relations, let, let, let's put it uh, this way. So all these situations have also had a very important part with respect to relations between the university, the municipality, and all the local institutions. And then very important things, I believe, also happened and are going to happen with respect to relations with national and international partners. 
So very close, very, very quickly, this is the what we call the planisphere or the map of our international relations. It's, I don't think it's even um, too updated. Just to mention that um, right now, the number of relations that each institution in Italy, this is Bologna, but the same, the, the, the very same holds for Padua, Milan, uh, Trento, Rome, and so on and so forth. All universities are very, very interconnected. And part of what happened, both with respect to the pandemic and with respect to the other cri political crisis, I think also um, would have been totally different 20, 30, 40 years ago. The interconnections are so strong now and have been strong, in the, especially strong in the last, I would say, decade or so. So how did we address the crisis, but maybe even more relevant at this point, what can we learn and what should we learn and what would we like to learn? So very, very quickly, um, Unibo and the pandemic, uh, we were very quick to get all the teaching online. Uh, we were able to, it was a kind of miracle, I, I, I must say, which also left me, um, hopefully no past or future or present rector is, is hearing me today, but I still got the suspect that we were already ready some, some way or another. Everything was somehow already there because in just two weeks, I mean, literally two weeks, we were able to have all the classes streaming uh, uh, on, on Teams. So we were able to keep the same days, the same schedule, everything looked more or less the same, but for the fact that we were not sitting in real classes. So in, in, in the short run, initiatives were taken to provide students with additional uh, resources. So again, together with the uh, municipality, resources were invested in order to make sure that all students had an efficient, a, a good updated uh, tablet or PC and Wi-Fi uh, keys, U USB keys for, for Wi-Fi uh, connections were provided to those who uh, did not have them. So very quickly, we were able to provide digital education in streaming uh, and very quickly, again, virtual mobility in the sense that we wanted to make sure that all our students who were around the world who wanted to come back were able to come back as quickly as possible, which was a huge effort. Um, but at the same time, those who wanted to be where, where, where they were, were able to attend classes online and take the credits and the other way around for those who were uh, attending our lectures from elsewhere. In the medium run, as Christina was, was mentioning, happened in Padova uh, as well. All the proper tools were put in all the classes to make sure that digital connections were great and, and, and Teams was working and so on and so forth. And very quickly, the trainees in medicine were directly involved in giving support uh, in the in the hospitals, it was a huge effort there, which I think is not recalled often enough and with enough uh, uh, emphasis. But I mean, they they were at the front at the forefront together with the medical doctors in helping out very quickly. Um, in the medium and long run, we had blended education since uh, September last year, so it's, it's been going on for two years now, which means that as soon as we were able to get back into the classes, we had students in the classes plus students attending the lecture on online, and most of them were actually also recording the lectures. Um, let me open uh, uh, some, some brackets here. Uh, in Bologna, there is a huge, I would say, debate right now with respect to how, especially the recording of the lectures is changing the students' habit. So we are sort of betting on the belief that the students really want to come back into classes in September, but every now and then somebody raises her hand or, or his hand saying, well, are, are we sure this is going to happen? Um, because students, for instance, who are also workers, and they are quite a, a bit of our students. I mean, we have um, 80, roughly 89,000 students in Bologna. Um, and, and quite a relevant portion of, of them, they are their uh, workers. So are we sure they are so keen in having um, teams just switched off in September? And we can open the debate on, on, on this eventually uh, later on. Uh, the pandemic has had very relevant impact on research. I will not uh, repeat what uh, Christina already stressed. Um, our ways of carrying out research changed. I'm a philosopher of science, so basically I was actually doing the same at home because I just need some books and a PC and 
and talk to people and we could do it on, on, on teams. Um, but very relevant changes were made in the sciences. So they, they tried to put so much lab material online to make sure that the students were able to have some access to previous facilities and, and in images and, and, and data, uh, which wasn't the same, but all the experimental work, which could one way or another be made virtual, was made virtual very, very quickly. Um, then this was much engagement on behalf of the life sciences, basically, but not only that, also partly the social sciences with respect to carry out modeling and experimental work, which was meant to fight the COVID virus. So it, it was a very quick, very, very, very sudden and very effective shift of so much research activity just from whatever you were doing uh, to the pandemic. And then I think that this is, relevant and again uh, food for thought we were very much involved into dissemination of what was discovered uh, step by step on the on the disease and we were involved in scientific debates maybe we were not as effective as we could have been because uh, you witnessed i think the let's say public debate on the on the pandemic and let's say it, it has been not always of a very high uh, scientific level. So what were the goals? We wanted to deliver the same contents as much as possible. We were very determined in not leaving anyone behind. Uh, we tried to uh, put some financial resources to give some relief. Uh, Christina was mentioning housing, mobility tools and, and, and stuff, but we also felt that especially during the hard lockdown moments, we had to keep the community alive. We, we had to find ways to keep the classes together and nourish a sense of community among students and between students and professors. Um, because we were experiencing something which was unprecedented. Um, we tried to design working groups online. That, that there was much fostering of dialogue and interaction, the distance notwithstanding. So um, as soon as we were able to teach online, we were also thinking, how can we make the teaching not just the delivering of lectures, of, of contents, how can we involve them? Because they're not meeting in the classes anymore. And that's gonna so deeply change their perception of what um, to be a university student is about. It's gonna, it's gonna I mean, for, for all of us, and obviously for, for you, the whole experience of being a university student is basically something which changes your life. It's your first huge experience as an autonomous old, old being. And not being able to, to, to do it is gonna have an impact on your, on your life. And it's, honestly, I, I don't want to sound harsh, but it's very difficult to do that later on in your life. It's a unique period of your, of your life. And we wanted to save that uh, with, with the tools that were available at that time. And then as happened in, in, in Padua, there was so pretty much, pretty much attention also to extra academic activities, both for academics and others. So lectures online, papers, uh, discussions, but also music, physical exercise, which was taught online eight in the morning, yoga classes and stuff like that. Difficulties. Uh, the first one I think was a sort of collective psychological burden. We were asked very quickly to get from the impression that, okay, this is gonna last a few months so we can deal with it. So uh, short term stress to long term stress to we don't know when this is going to end kind of stress. Um, and I'm not sure that we have still come to terms with, with this. Um, and then again, are we getting used to digital education? Do we really want to get back to classes? My, my rector is very determined. He wants to switch teams off. And although we get on very well with each other, there are some discussion going, going on on this. The Afghan scenario, very, very similar to what happened here. We have, some, I mean, um, again, it's strong collaboration between the Emilia-Romagna region and all the universities in Emilia-Romagna. So the region said, uh, universities in Emilia Romagna, so Ferrara, Parma, Unimore, and Bologna, we are going to put a resource, bring the resources together, so some money from the region, some money from the universities, and build a scheme which is going to work for all uh, Afghan people who want to come and study in your universities, and they're going to pick the ones that they prefer. 
Bologna has an international offer, uh, which is kind of larger in the sense that our the, the, the number of international courses delivered in English that we have is slightly larger for obvious reasons. So we, we had more uh, requests. At the end, we have roughly 40 refugees who are enrolled in our courses. Uh, I think 38 is the, the most updated number. Uh, more of them applied, but then not all of them were, were uh, finalized. We decided, myself and my delegates, to meet each of them. So we had online meetings with each of them to understand what the uh, situation uh, they, they, they came from was like. And it was, I must say, a very strong psychological kind of experience. Uh, getting back, I don't know whether we were ready to do it, and I don't know whether we would do it again. A, a, a it was a very strong experience uh, emotionally for us all. So again, comment here. Um, Professors get to become vice rectors for I, now. I just for my, myself, not 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 for the colleagues. Um, people who are professors, they carry out their standard job. Then, at some point, they become vice rectors for international relations, um, and and it, it is the case because they have I don't know run Erasmus exchange programs. They have studied abroad. They have been part of international committees. So far, so good. And then they face crises such as Afghan crisis and Ukrainian crisis. Are, are we ready? Honestly, I was not. Uh, I'm trying. I'm trying my, my best. But we should, I think, also think about what kind of education should be given to vice rector. I'm just talking for myself um, <laughs> to, to, for international relations because it's been really, really hard. Um, again, strong collaboration with Ergo, which is the Agenzia Regionale per il Diritto agli Studi Superiori, which is our, let's say, arm, right, right arm. We also delivered a few conferences and, and workshops. I know at, at some point in the program, we, you had the um, ambassador from Afghanistan, and we had him online a few times to have his, his, his view. What we noted is that all the, actually, there the, the were more than 50 people we interviewed and, and we spent time with online. They were all very different from one another. So uh, each of them had his or her personal story. Some of them were very, very young, 18, 19. Some of them were kind of quite old, oldish, I mean, my, my age. Um, women, some of them, mostly men, uh, very different attitude. Some of them were very bluntly putting it on, on us. I mean, it's the Western fault. So what we are here in such a, a tough situation because of the ways in which your countries behaved with respect to our country, which is again, something you have to, to face when you, when you deal with these people. Um, very different background knowledge. Some of them were people that had already PhDs, uh, more than one degree. Um, very different ambitions. Some of them said, we are just here to rebuild our life. We're never going to go back. Some of them, we want to go back as soon as possible. And these are not details because they totally change the way in which they want to enter the system, integrate, not integrate. Obviously, it's, it's something that you can do if you are interviewing 50 people. If the numbers increase, it's not something that you can, you can do. Conflict in Ukraine. Uh, there's the link, we, we very kind of quickly build up a, a web page and also an um, email address, which is uh, emergenza.ukraina.unibo.it uh, to put all the information there. We, we, ha we have and we had and have a kind of high number of Ukrainian students and Russian students at Unibo, roughly the same number, roughly 200 and 200. So, equal communities. Um, they asked for help very, very quickly, and we met them online as quickly as we, as we could. And then a number of initiatives started. So um, deferment of payment of fees for all of them. Uh, scholarships, I must say, for Ukrainian students, and we can discuss it later on if you want. For both current students, so students who were already in Bologna and for future ones, fellowships for scholars, we have uh, to different formats right now. We have some fellowships which are not related to any disciplinary subjects. Um, the net amount is 1,581 euros per month and with the accommodation already included. And we have four of them right now. And then we, had, we asked all the departments to offer what they could. So there's a list of departments offering things, different things, three months, six months, three years, one year and a half, whatever, um, devoting 
those those fundings to specific projects. So you, you will find some in archaeology, history, chemistry, physics, whatever. We also did something I, we offered, I didn't put it here because I forgot, we also offered psychological support for all the people who felt in, in need. We built up a series of conferences. They are already, I must, they are still, sorry, uh, going, going on every Friday, actually. And then we did also something, and I do something I'm particularly proud of. So the Ukrainian students um, told us we want to do something, we want to help. And the huge number of refugees from Ukraine very, very quickly arrived in Bologna. We had quite a few thousands. So the, the, the uh, municipality was totally overwhelmed by the number of, of refugees who were arriving. So we put the students and the municipality in contact in order to have interpreters and translators in the prima accoglienza, in the, in the tents, basically, in which people were, were uh, welcome. In order, for instance, to, I mean, to, to, to welcome them, to understand what the situation was like, to help them find accommodation, to vaccinate them, because this is something, again, we need. We need. I mean, the pandemics and the Ukraine conflict have something in, in between, which is uh, many, many of these people, I would say, I mean, I'm, I'm told the majority are not vaccinated. So we also had, and then we also realized that in order to have our Ukrainian students explain refugees, for instance, that they'd better vaccinate, we also need to provide some crash courses of cultural mediation, even if they were Ukrainian, to address these issues in the right way. So again, as for the vice rectors, when you put people at the forefront, you need to provide them with some tools to deal with delicate matters in the, in the right way. Um, and then we're doing something else. We have, I mean, before Easter, the number was 108, but they are increasing. We have a number of kids from Ukraine uh, going, which, which are um, joining our classes, primary and low secondary school classes. And our students are building basically uh, afternoon courses to help the student, the kids integrating in the, in the classes and they are organizing summer camps for the same purpose. Critical aspects, we could rely luckily enough on some previous experience we or i mean not not myself but luckily enough some of my colleagues who claudia uh, knows uh, had already had some collaboration with scholars at risk so we had some some schemes some some ideas of what that was about and Unibar had already been involved in the project of corridors for refugee and we could rely on some sharing of scientific and experience but and also i must say and i'm very pleased to say it because Christina is here, Antonella is online, and my colleague is here. I think that there was much cooperation between Italian universities within CRUI. So we, we could interact with each other, and this was, is, was, is, and is going to be precious. Um, observations here, some, some reflection here. I think we need to pay, when, when crises come, you, when, when crises break out, you need to pay special attention to single cases. They cannot be dealt with as standard students. We are uh, enrolling Ukrainian students, so students who were students in Ukraine in our courses for free. They are different from our standard students. There's, 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 there's no doubt. And it would be, I think, hypocritical to treat them as if they are as if they were like our student students. So some situations are more fragile and they need more time, more resources, different structured offices, different international offices within universities. Um, another topic, which, which is a hot one in Bologna, we are welcoming people, but not of them are single. People are arriving with families. Uh, students and scholars <laughs> come with kids, families, spouses. Uh, and this is an extra problem because the university is not ready to take care of families. That's not our core business, but it is something that we need to face. Uh, huge linguistic issues, also, for instance, with respect to legal matters. People um, rely on universities when they don't understand how to deal, for instance, with the questura, when they don't understand how to deal with the permesso di soggiorno. And this, again, needs specific uh, expertise and being able to translate norms into different languages. Huge accommodation issues. There's not a single flat free in Bologna. Yesterday, I called the uh, secretary of Cardinale Zuppi, who is a great person. And he told me, I mean, Don Sebastiano told me, we, we 
don't know where, where to put people anymore. And this is a big problem. And then there's a number of health related issues. People leaving their countries are not always healthy people. So if you want to be in charge of them, you also need to deal with how they feel, I mean, their, their well being, which means um, making sure that they have access to the hospital. So, for instance, the translators and interpreters among our Ukrainian students are also supporting uh, our hospitals and the ASL, the, the, the public health system. Common features. We were all extremely quick in reacting, and this is to be noticed. We were all extremely devoted and, and, and quick. It was a joint reaction, as I was saying. We made great partnership with local institution and with international institutions. So um, I think that international relations proved as, integra as an integrative component in tackling the crisis and searching for solutions. We are all involved as universities in so many international networks, and we're spending so much time within European alliances and building task forces, within GILT, within uh, EWA, and so on and so forth to understand what we should do. Increase in the awareness of our institutional role, which has been challenged, and the sense of social responsibility and social engagement. I'm trying to be quick now. So the, the local context I already mentioned, uh, I will try to skip and, and, and get to, to the end. Can we uh, try to draw some at least provisional uh, take home lessons? So I think that we have realized that the crisis need to be addressed by relying on previously holding relations. So all the relations that we have been building for years and, and decades have been wonderfully present when crisis arrived. And we need to learn to make the most out of partnerships and, and networks uh, for mutual support and benefit. For instance, the Magna Carta Observatory was present in Bologna is providing great support in terms of reflections on values and the role of universities in, in these days. Uh, crises also make pre-existing limits emerge. When, when, when times get rough, you realize that there were problems which actually were already there and you hadn't realized they were so bad until you're forced to, to, to face them. But at the same time, if we want to see it in the, in, the, in the positive, they encourage us to make some step forward. And that's the point at which we, we are. We need to, we were able to, and we need to think further about making innovative solutions. For instance, virtual mobility is a concept which wasn't there before, before the crisis. And we need to realize that we are very unlikely to go entirely back to the previous situation. And I also think, and I want to stress this, that we need to grant coherence between principles and actions. All the strategic plans of our universities have so many references to values, freedom, academic freedom, autonomy, liberty, and so on and so forth. I think that the crisis are challenging us to put these principles into, into practice. But at the same time, we need to make sure that our actions are feasible, which means that we need to deal with the financial matters. Where do we want resources to be allocated? Uh, Christina was mentioning, and I was smiling, the ministry allocated 1 million euros, I think two days before the conflict started, but we haven't seen a single euro from, from that because the decreti attuativi haven't allowed universities to apply for those funds. And a few weeks have passed since then. Last slide, I promise, challenges, challenges ahead. Digital tools. We need to try to switch from a use of digital tools in emergency education to really innovative teaching. So it's not a surrogative. We need to foster new approaches. And this is one of the points I, I tend to raise with my rector. I think that digital tools can foster inclusivity if we use them properly. We need to understand how we want to design, but also share learning environments. And there are so much issues here, so many issues here with respect to intellectual properties, sharing of data. We need to realize that our systems are complex and fragile. So we need to understand how we want to combine far-sighted visions. We, we want to be innovative, if not universities who should have far-sighted visions, but then try to also to understand what resources are available and what our current procedures are like. We're trying in CRUI to press some changes with respect to norms. So we need to bring together goals, means, and methods. We need great challenges. We need to, we want to be excellent. I mean, Padua, I mean, Christina and, and I get wonderfully on, wonderfully well uh, together, but our universities are competitors. We want to be excellent. 
but we are devoting so much effort to things which don't have anything to do with rankings, for instance, or, or, or publishing. So we want to be inclusive and excellent. We want physical, we want mobility to be back to, to be physical, but yet we want it to be sustainable. And traveling is expensive and traveling impacts on the environment. And in the end, I think that all we are saying has to do with what we think universities are for at the end of the day. Thank you. This is a very challenging question, <laughs> what a university asks for. Very interesting. Thank you so much for your talk. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Luca Marcozzi, who is full professor of Italian literature in Roma Trial University and was um, for, is former until actually is a former inter, inter institutional, I'm sorry, Erasmus Plus program coordinator uh, until a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Uh, he is going to give a, a speech about the international mobility as a mean to face a new post crisis scenario. Thank you, Professor Lomellini, also for inviting me. I'm among vice rectors. I'm not vice rector, but I have to say that in Roman Clay there is there, there is not a vice rector for international relations. We had a vice rector for university networks till some years ago. Then it was not substituted and when he retired. So I have I was the delegate from the rector for um, international mobility. Uh, the problem is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, the director resigned, so we are undergoing an uh, electoral process, a new rector is coming, and uh, obviously all the delegates from the rector resigned with him. So uh, I'm a former coordinator. Uh, I was coordinator when I was invited, uh, however. However, I'm not in charge anymore, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm free to, to say everything I, I can... I can uh, However, it's, um, I think that my, my place here is um, uh, mostly because I followed um, a, an Erasmus project with uh, the University of Herat in Afghanistan, and it started in 2017. So 2017, it's only uh, five years ago, but the world has changed in uh, five years since then. Really, uh, I, I was uh, trying to recap all the events that uh, came from 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 when in Istanbul in 2017, um, I was invited by the European Commission and the Erasmus uh, program to a meeting, a contact seminar with Central Asia uh, universities. It was a big meeting uh, uh, to make agreements, to know each other physically, I mean, in, in, in person, in presence. In 2017, we could uh, made, make th this kind of meetings with 400, 400 people in a room or something like that. However, we met uh, universities from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, uh, and Afghanistan too. I met Afghan people, Af Afghani colleagues, mostly from Herat University. Uh, it was interesting because uh, this, this meeting was intended, we, we, we received then uh, 11 rectors from uh, Kazakhstan University a few months later. It was a great meeting and we could uh, uh, write with them some project and some of them as uh, they have been uh, funded then by the European Union. Uh, they, are, they, are, they were really looking from for a acquaintance or a way to to talk with European universities and to explore uh, some of the good practices that we, we had. And they, they wanted to develop a new, um, can I say, um, new teachers, uh, new professional figures uh, far from the uh, reference point that they had uh, until then, that was Russia. They wanted to look to Europe, and this contact seminar was very, very important. Apart from that, I met people from uh, Herat University. I'm talking about my own experience. Um, Herat, that is in the western part, southwestern part of uh, Afghanistan near the Iranian border, uh, it, it was had, I mean, there was an um, Italian military mission in Herat. And uh, people from them had a quite good, good opinion of our uh, soldiers. 
Especially, it, the, the mission was called the Resolute Support, but it was a no-combat mission. It was written, the engagement rules were absolutely not to fire. And uh, it was in support of non-profit organizations, cooperation, and uh, this was very good for, I mean, the, the colleagues of the Iraq University had a good uh, relationship with, with Italy as they saw Italian people in that, in that way. So we made uh, an agreement with them. And we applied together for a uh, funding by European Union in the framework of the Erasmus program. This funding is in the framework of a project, a program that is called K, K, K Action 107, that is cooperation in the, in the previous Erasmus program, because down from 2021 on it, it has changed. However, it was the cooperation with non partner and non program countries. So if you wanted to exchange students and uh, lecturers with universities of countries outside European space, you had to be funded by this kind of programs called KA 107. And we wrote the project along with them, together with them. What kind of project it was? Sorry, my clock. Um, it was a project um, dedicated mostly to um, academic recognition of inter international experience. Uh, it was for raising the international commitment of the University of Herat, that is a quite important university in southwestern Afghanistan. Uh, it has about 20,000 students. And most important, uh, the student body for the 60%, it, 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 was, it was made by women. Uh, so this project was dedicated mostly to uh, recognition of international experience and also to women's engagement. We mm, wrote that half, at least, of the places for the mobility uh, should be reserved for women. And they agreed. I have to say that this kind of project, it's written by, by bot. It's not a, a project that we write and we ask them to approve. We write it, we wrote it together. The Italian partner is the one who uh, has to undergo the evaluation of the European Commission. So we uh, submit the project, we sign the project and submit the project, but also the partner signs the project, the funding obviously uh, come to the Italian university, but then they are shared with the partner. We pay the travel expenses and the missions of the partner. Uh, we were funded. We had a great evaluation of this project. It seemed very interesting and effective to the European Commission who funded us. And we decided to exchange uh, six students and four lecturers incoming from Akfaya. It's, it's not a big number, but it, it's this kind of project of KA 107 project are mostly on this, this, these numbers from six to eight students, from two to eight lecturers. They had to be realistic, of course. <clears throat> and two of us should have gone to Afghanistan to increase the good, to I mean, to put in common our practices in academic recognition and to, uh, I want to say, explain, to, 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 to make them know how we recognize the international experience, how it's good for one's career, how it's important to uh, keep a communication with colleagues around in the world. Um, the rules of the selection committees are, um, can I say, are shared, and they have to make, they, they had, they, they should have, because this project obviously was quite interrupted, but then we took it over. Um, however, it was 2018. In 2017, we met them. In 2018, we wrote the project and we underwent the 
um, evaluation. In 2019, we had fundings. We had uh, this project approved and we had fundings. On the very same day, which I received the note from the European Commission in which the project was funded, I, I read on the newspapers, I knew that the Italian military mission in Erat uh, decided that from the 1st January of the following year, they, that there would be, there would have been a disengagement. They would have abandoned Herat. So this was the big, the first big strike for our project. Then for a while, after the Italian mission went over, I could not communicate with, obviously the communication with the colleagues in Herat were on a daily basis or so, on a weekly basis, let's say so. From that point on, and why, after we uh, communicated again, and they told me that after the Italian mission was retiring, the Taliban had come and cut all the, uh, the phone lines and the internet. So really they could not communicate with, the, with us. However, the mobility was planned by uh, starting from spring 2020. And then it came the pandemic. So, one, I mean, uh, like in the movies, no, the, the hero that has to, um, to uh, a series of obstacles. However, in spring 2020, all the, the pandemic came and uh, the project was interrupted. Uh, all our administration uh, was taken full time, engaged full time in the pandemic. Uh, um, emergency, as soon as we could found, find some relief, we started it over. Uh, about the pandemic, I have to say, uh, the position of the university, of course, we too, uh, uh, as the wall of universities in Italy, I think, in a few days, we, we, we moved to the online, uh, or to the online courses. Any of us has the capacity, has the, the, can do that easily. We were supported by our administration, our IT support. It was really quite easy for any of us to do that. However, uh, we also firmly wanted to keep at least some physical class or blended class. I, I was in person, in, in presence, except the first semester for all last year with my students, with few students that were regulated uh, in, in, in the number uh, who could, uh, and the, who, that could enter the, the, the buildings. But we, we firmly wanted to keep alive the in-person teaching. Uh, really, going online was not a big issue. The issue is now to come back to physical uh, classes. Because university is not only the class. I mean, we think meeting with, with students, meeting with mates, this is more important. My memory as a student, discussing. I, I remember more the, discussion, more the discussions that I have with my mates at the end of the classes than the classes themselves. Yeah, the classes were important, but discussing the, 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 the matter of, of the classes, it, it, it was more, more and more important to gain and to form, to, to, to make a debate, to, to gain a critical uh, approach to what the teacher or the lecturer told us. Online classes, in my view, are not tumbling down walls, as it was said at the beginning of the emergency. They are building new virtual walls around the students' rooms. That's my view. However, um, virtual mobility, this is a matter of facts. As soon as we could recover with the Erasmus program in full, uh, in the last call, last March, we had the higher number of application in the history of our university. So that's because the students want to physically meet other students all around the world. 
Um, I have to say that uh, in the last call, uh, a benefit for the students for the green uh, the placement has been uh, made by the European Commission. So the students that are not taking, that are not flying to their destination and uh, who go by train uh, are funded uh, with 50 euros on their, <laughs> I mean, there is a, a higher amount of their scholarship, 50 years, however. Let's go back to, to Afghanistan. Uh, Afghani colleagues, they could not come in 2021. They could not come because Afghanistan was stormed, as you all know. They are trying to come now. They will come next week, as far as I know. I hope they could. Uh, we signed all the paperwork. Uh, they simply need a visa. I was saying that they need visa. It should be addressed as not an issue, as a simple question. They had the right. They had an invitation. They had. They they participate to a European program. They have funding. Uh, they have uh, travel expenses paid. They have a scholarship, which with they can pay, they afford their stay in Italy. Notwithstanding, having issued a visa, it's very, very complicated. Not only because they have to go to Doha. They cannot do it in Afghanistan. We don't have a diplomatic uh, seat in Afghanistan. They have to go physically or somehow to the consulate in Qatar. But it, it, it's very, very hard to obtain a visa, uh, as I will explain. The process is, is, is not easy. At the beginning of the emergency in Afghanistan last summer, I heard some colleagues of other universities saying on TV that uh, they would have saved uh, hundreds of students from Kabul that already were international universities with foreign people, with foreign universities, they were quite sentenced to that. They could have been kept and killed any moment. So from one side, they had the right, they had the funding, they had the right to apply for a visa, they had the right to come here. From the other side, if someone discovered this, they could die. And what we could do about that also, since we could not communicate with them, we were invited not to do that. We kept communication secret, let's say. So we didn't use the official channels. Communicating is not an issue, of course. Also obtaining a passport, it's, it's not easy for them. Uh, I, I called, I wrote many, many times to the Afghan embassy in Rome asking them to issue diplomatic passports because the Afghan embassy is not recognized for, 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 from the uh, Taliban government. So probably they could have helped us in that. I called many times the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Italy and they helped us. They helped me, they helped us. Uh, clarifying the, 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 the process. Obtaining a visa, it's not easy because it, 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 even if you have the right to come here, even if you have the money to come here, even if you have the place to sleep and to live, and the region um, helped us with dorms and with the places to, to stay. However, obtaining a visa is not automatic because the process has to undergo for security reasons is not uh, managed only by the foreign affairs, but it's managed also by uh, people dealing with security with services connected to security problems. So it's not easy, it's not uh, fast. So we have many phases of the problem to afford and not all these problems can be afforded by universities. That's the main question, the main problem also connected with the Ukrainian crisis, crisis is that we cannot deal with all the, as university. As university, we can do our job. We can ensure full recognition 
to uh, the academic career of the Ukrainian students. For this, there's an issue on the regulations, because um, in our regulations, we can admit to university uh, students that had had a, a, a process of at least 12 years of primary and secondary education, while the Ukrainian system is of 11 years. So we have to change the regulations, we have to make a, say, a little shift in the regulation, or um, more commonly, in the meanwhile, we can uh, admit only the students that already had the first year of university in Ukraine. That's what we do. We ensure, even if they are not in the European uh, space of higher education, we are uh, very, uh, it's easy to, to make a full recognition of, of their uh, previous career. Obviously, the tuition fee is waived. Uh, there's no problem from, from, for that. The problem is having uh, a lodgement. This is, a, 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 a as, as the colleague recalled us, Lazio region helped us uh, for the Afghanistan, but for Ukraine, it, it's not so easy. Um, Again, with the Afghan people, we as a university, as Padova did in our uh, numbers, we, uh, I mean, we ensured, apart from the project I said, uh, 12 scholarships for Afghan students. And also this call had to be uh, keep, kept secret. We put it on the website for half an hour and we put it away. And uh, so we had this, uh, a response to this call. We will give 13 um, scholarships in the fields of education, arts, engineering, and archaeology to 12 female students and one male. And I hope they can come, not, not only for the visa, but also because uh, they cannot travel alone as women. They had to travel with a relative, a husband, a brother, or something like that. We don't know how they, they, they can. Uh, the main problem dealing with this kind of, uh, and I'm closing, of, of uh, crisis is that we, as university, we are university. We are, of course, in contact with non-profit no organizations, with everyone we can grant us a support, but it's a drop in the sea. If it was effective with the Afghan crisis that involved not so many students, uh, and not a, a so critical mass of people knocking on Italy's door, how many people came from Afghanistan? 10,000, 12,000 in the last, I mean, during the crisis. What is if compared to the millions of people coming from Ukraine? So uh, the, the issues we had to deal with with the Afghan crisis are not the same that we are dealing with a Ukraine crisis in terms of number. In other words, we, as university, we can use all our uh, energy to do what we are able to do. But for other problems, we are not, I mean, we cannot be the solution to our problems. During the Afghan crisis, we had something like a war room, sorry for the word, an emergency room we participated too with the region, with the agency for the, the rights of the students, uh, Lazio Disco is called, with, with the, and, and we had some of uh, some meetings and we could solve these problems. Now it's a little more difficult because many other uh, forces are involved. However, we will do all the best as any university is doing um, with the help of 
the institutions, I think that we can deal also with this crisis. However, our main goal with Ukrainian students is to uh, ask them to let them come here as they could. I have to say, we have in our university 72 students already uh, enrolled, Ukrainian students. Most of them live in Italy, and two of them are of double citizenship, Ukrainian and Russian. That's, uh, I, I don't want to be in their thoughts now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Marco Marcuzzi. Uh, now I'm introducing the last speaker uh, of today uh, before Professor Padovani will join us discussing. Um, she is uh, Antonella Baldi, Professor Antonella Baldi, uh, who is Vice Rector for Internationalization at the University of Milan since 2018. Uh, she is full professor in animal nutrition at the University of Milan. And as Vice Rector, uh, she represents the University of Milan in the Alliance for EU Plus in the frame of the Erasmus Plus European University Program. Uh, she will uh, present a paper dealing with the role of international partnership of universities in addressing uh, global challenges. And hopefully the IT service is helping us and she will be, she will appear on the screen very soon. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that everything works, that we'll try. Before sharing the screen with my presentation, I would like to thank a lot for this invitation. Valentina is really nice to ask me to be there, even if virtually, and I apologize for that, but I have a flight in this afternoon and so I cannot attend personally. Anyway, I have also to say that I listen with a lot of attention and also condivisions of the previous uh, presentations and I'm fully aligned with 100% of the of the uh, aspect and issues that has been raised that are issued also of University of Milan and also interventions from University of Milan because see, as uh, Christina and Rafaela said we were highly connected even now we have also in chat and we have a WhatsApp of international delegate that ask in, in any moment, uh, which are the common problems, how to solve. So that was an experience we had uh, during COVID. And now, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of other crises to deal. And so that's why we are always in connection. But uh, I would like to share my screen. Let's see if I'm able to. Do you see it? Yes, we do. Okay, so I don't see you anymore, but of course we are accustomed to that from also our normal lesson in these three, two years and a half. Anyway, uh, as I said before, uh, we are really, really um, in line with the interventions, the problems, also the issue raised uh, during these uh, two year and a half, I would say, of uh, crisis. And uh, of course, uh, my presentation uh, will, uh, will be more about uh, how, how this crisis uh, had uh, affected uh, the internationalization of our university, but at the same time, vice versa, how uh, our universities are reacting to them. And so, the, so far the current crisis stress I needed to cope with the never experienced before challenges. And so we must equip our students, the new generations with the knowledge and skill set needed to address that. But as Rafaela said, also ourselves has to be updated because this kind of problem is not an everyday life uh, problems to cope. So also us as professors, but also of course, as part of the governance has a very clear responsibility and we have to be in line. So that's why also it's so strong the link between us because we support each other also in very critical choices that we made during this period. Um, in particularly, of course, the universities which the, very immediately from the present to online um, activities. And so that's show us how digital technologies can support 
us, but also new form of collaboration so that university can and should further develop to set up together novel practices for sustainable and more inclusive also internationalization because our students from abroad our international students didn't come here but we have all we have not lost one of them we were able to include all them from home even they they are connected from india from asia from everywhere we have the registration so they was a problem of time of the day, of course, so they could follow when we have registered in another time span than other. But this was a tremendous push also for maintaining them with us. Uh, so the previous, at the same time, the Ukraine and previously Afghanistan crisis show us very clearly that it must be ready to react also to this kind of, of problems. And I would like to to say that this changed completely also our model of international partnerships, even if uh, I would say that already in the past a few years, uh, something was completely changed in the term to a more holistic approach. Of course, you no, know, we are consolidated, all of our university has a consolidated research, education, uh, collaborations uh, with uh, bilateral, multilateral partnerships, but more and more now our university is shifting to a new collaborative paradigm when we research education innovation service to societies which are the mission of universities are more integrated also in the international collaborations and at the same time we have a more high involved of citizens and that make also a step forward to what uh, previously Marcozzi said. What is a science diplomacy? What is our uh, possibility in how we have to interact with, the, you know, we must interact with universities in country where academic freedom is totally out. So this is a major problem because came out very, very clearly with the Russian university right now, but even before, Okay, university is no more in a ivory tower, so it's not detached from uh, the, the country they work in, but at the same time, how must has our uh, behavior in the establishing collaboration, don't say now about Russian, of course, but with the universities in, in uh, countries or in region where, where academic freedom is actually uh, out or banned, where there are really, really problems like uh, uh, we have heard in the last presentation. So this science and diplomacy is also how to align the functioning and also the activities of our university in collaborating with new with countries and facing new challenges. So what uh, I would like in a way to focus more uh, our uh, interventions uh, to, uh, towards the COVID uh, and uh, the crisis in Ukraine and Afghanistan in the frame of uh, European strategies for universities and in the frame of our alliances that I know everybody, every, the other colleagues here, the other university here has uh, also take part of uh, these initiatives of European alliances uh, that is uh, launched by uh, European commissions in 2019. Uh, in fact, uh, the recent European strategies for universities and the proposal for a council recommendation on transnational cooperation stress what we are speaking about it today. So the need of, uh, of to be a more easy access to mobility abroad to life for a truly European study path and experience. The strategy and like challenges and also objectives such as strength and European dimension in other education, support universities as lighthouse of European way of life, uh, empower universities actors of change and reinforce universities drivers. So, Focusing on uh, Europe is not a, a, a secondary aspect because as you know very, very well in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, we have still uh, major problems of integration and inclusion. So we speak the same languages, but we have still a lot of uh, differences in many, many aspects of university life. And not only we have different languages, we have different rules, we have also differences 
in a lot of other aspects related to how the member states deal with the degree, deals with the accreditation of studies and so on. So it's not, it's quite, it's quite important, this, ap this aspect. And uh, to do that, um, to try to uh, be more inclusive and also to deeply enroot the European culture, uh, the commission has launched these uh, uh, initiatives, the, the European university initiatives. And right now we have 41, uh, 41 already running European universities. Uh, that means that uh, um, that is the enlarging, it will become about 60 in 2023. There was the two calls, so there is running now a third one, and about 300 higher education university are, uh, institutes are involved in this, in this program. Uh, so what's the meaning? Uh, the meaning is of this, and the meaning is to have a push, to have a push towards a more integrated system, even at European level, to also be, more effective beyond also at in global level and this is a very a very important steps also because for the first time we are aligned in term education of research we have the same commissioner maria gabriel that he's the, the commissioner the head of research innovation and education uh, for your uh, uh, commission in uh, in you and she and the group strongly wants this more integrated approach, as I told you before, between research, innovation, education. So, and service also to, to society, I would say. So, um, but let's go back to the topic of today. So how we deal with this crisis, with uh, COVID-19 and uh, Afghanistan and Ukraine, but in the former, in, in, as an alliances. Also, University of Milan take part of for you plus alliances. So what we want to do in other alliances is we are six partners, uh, University of Milan, Sorbonne University, Heidelberg, University Charles from Prague, Warsaw at Copenhagen. We are right now 250,000 students all together. And what, what we want, we are doing in these first three years because we started in 2019 was a, a very, more integrated way to uh, to offer uh, to our students uh, new new programs, joint programs, but also uh, in line of what we said before. So in line of having more integration between research and education, therefore around four flagships. One is on health and demographic change. The second one is a more humanistic and political science field. It is called Europe in a changing world. Then we have one more on digital aspects of transformation and communication. And then the fourth one is on biodiversity and sustainable development. But what, and in this frame, we have already launched about 80 common programs and we are also preparing uh, degrees, especially one degree that was highly inspired by the, 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 the last problems related not only to Afghanistan and Ukraine, but we have to think also to Africa because if we think where the conflict are regularly present. We have to think that Africa was really, uh, uh, we really the conflict by, by the way country. So I think that this is important to deal and we as a European university has to face also to prepare to prepare, as uh, you already said, uh, uh, this uh, uh, more integrate way, and so to, to, to prepare to, to include and to integrate, or better to say, include people coming from students, but also scholars and from a university of Africa and also from Afghanistan and Ukraine in our system. So we have to equip to prepare professionals able, able to deal with. And that's what we did during COVID-19 has an alliances. Um, well, as we have launched uh, several, um, several courses online, of course, we, we have maintained our activity online. And uh, you can see some of them, uh, and also the date you see 23, 27 November, 2020. We have prepared this urban health case challenge 
community resilience in times of COVID-19. As you know, Milan was uh, the first place where there was a tremendous increase of a thousand and thousands everyday death for COVID. And we start immediately with our medicine faculties to speak also with the medicine faculties of in the flagship one, but not only in the medicine, but also in all other fields, especially social science, economics, urban, as you say, uh, problems to face uh, this uh, challenge of COVID-19. And uh, we prepare this course with a comprehensive approach to develop by students uh, the best solution to real world issue, to cases uh, that uh, in a limited time span to, to, to be uh, able then to, to think fast and to react. Each team presented their solution to specific problems that were raised during pandemia and in front of an expert jury at the pitching session of the last day of the case challenge, they were evaluated uh, by them and they were also comparing the different solution. Or another example is this course on COVID-19 and data literacy, a comprehensive journey to the odyssey of our era. Well, this is a very multidisciplinary aspect and it was very also interesting to see how the di diverse geographic area of Europe uh, had a different situation and react in a different way. And also other important uh, uh, workshops were held with our students and of course staff, uh, and also with the participation of municipalities because municipalities of Milan take part also as well of these alliances. Uh, so also more recently during the crisis in Afghanistan and nowadays uh, in Ukraine, we have mobilized together forces. Of course, you, uh, as you have seen, we have Warsaw University inside the alliances and Warsaw University was in the front line in uh, organizing uh, the, of course, the moving of, uh, of students, of uh, scholars, of teachers from Ukraine universities maintaining online courses. So so we offer our online courses, joint online courses, but also regular online courses uh, to them in order that they do not interrupt uh, as soon as, as it was possible their, uh, their, their course uh, of studies. Of course, uh, we have uh, uh, had uh, many, as University of Milan, many other initiatives. Uh, I would suggest to say that we have right at the beginning of the conflicts, we have 250 Ukrainian students in our university. So our first line of action was, uh, of course, to help them, especially not those who are already uh, resident in Milan, that is a quite a good, a good number, but half of them were not. And so we offer them not only fellowships, but also residencies, because of course they couldn't pay they couldn't pay their uh, the, the, the house, so we moved into the in, into the our into our residences, and we also help them psychological support them, and then we have as well established uh, a number of. Uh, um, grants also for people coming abroad, both as uh, scholar at risk and as fellowships for students. But at the same time, we were very, very related with other university of the Alliance in order to discuss together what was the best way to help uh, to help University of Ukraine. And we had a meeting with them last week, the uh, European University Alliances, all of them, the 41 of them representatives met with the Ukrainian universities. And what they asked in fact was of course help, of course uh, courses, uh, of course financial support, but they, what mainly asked was, is it possible to join the alliances? They wanted to enter in the, in the uh, European university initiatives. They want to join actively because it, they need this feeling of belonging. They need to say, we are in Europe. And this is quite, it's all for them, even perhaps more important in that situation of uh, the other uh, initiatives. Well, 
But at the same time, uh, I will want to move from the experience that uh, we did as for you plus to what uh, also Rafaela and, uh, and uh, uh, Christina said that there is a very high number of partnerships and networkings. And it, it, there, it was a little bit change uh, the, the type of networking that we're doing right now with respect to those that we did uh, 20 years ago, for instance. And these are quite some example of University of Milan. In, uh, in 2000, 2010, in this first decade uh, of the 21st century, the networking uh, were more related uh, like LIRU, that is the League of uh, European Research Universities of Milan take part, but there are many other similar like GILS, IWA. These are more uh, networks that have the uh, uh, the goal to, uh, to, to, to present the voice of university into the commission, European commission, to, to make a little bit of lobby in a good sense of word in terms of the development of education and research at, the, at European level. So we as university want to be present in these tables. We want to say our opinion, our words, not only member states. And so we are, uh, this was the, the, a group, a sort of, uh, of a group of networking impacting to commission, give a university voice. Afterwards, there was a little bit of shift to other uh, type of partnership and networks. I put CROSS here because CROSS, uh, as you know, Valentina is part also of your IPSE uh, network. And uh, in this case, it is more related to policy and security network. And um, CROSS is the, our criminal organized uh, um, center of University of Milan and works with many other partnerships uh, on uh, especially Latin America and also Northern Europe, uh, where the, this problem of organized criminality is not so uh, well studied like unfortunately in Italy. And so this is another kind of, uh, of, uh, of networking uh, with other objective. And then you no, know, in 2016, after the two, uh, 115, uh, of course, sustainable goals agenda, there was some networks with the goals of like the rules of a, a sustainable goal uh, networking or Ugreen, which is on global health. So these is were more related to um, engagement with uh, the, uh, of course, the climate, health, the, tip, the classical important Challenges, challenges that we are facing right now. But in the same time, there was also other global uh, global network like U7 Plus, which is quite new as the first global, completely global alliances of university with almost 60 universities around the world, which has the goal of promoting the bridging between uh, uh, research, teaching, but also in different fields, social science, humanities, life science, STEM, medicine, and with the goal of uh, on one side, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship in different areas of the world, and at the same time also to, to, to address uh, values of university. And in terms of values of university, these are the networks that was already mentioned uh, before of scholar at risk and also the program Unicor. This is another kind of way of, uh, of uh, internationalization, is a solidarity internationalization, is an inclusion, need of inclusion. And scholars at risk, you know very well because all the university take part uh, as were well, very active uh, both in Afghanistan and now uh, in Ukrainian uh, crisis. As University of Milan, we had five Afghan uh, uh, scholars arriving with many difficulties on visa, as you already said, but and with the family as well. That is another point that comes with family. So we need a strict link with the municipality, with the institution uh, of the environment around us, the region, and so on. Uh, 
And uh, Unicore uh, is the program of university colleges for refugees already mentioned, and even is do not deal with uh, Ukraine right now, it deals with African students. And in this moment, we have five students uh, coming from Ethiopia, and then we have one more still selected from other areas of Africa. So, and then Rumi Pace that all of you know very well. So you see, a shift, that, why, why I show you this timetable, I would say, because it will shift, it can, a change in terms of networking, like has our responsibilities as universities in take an active part to react, to also involve our students, because this is another important part in, in this, uh, in this international problem, uh, how is, uh, can help, uh, to cope with conflicts can help also uh, to enhance equality, diversion, inclusion. Uh, it takes many advantages to our university because we'll build community which improve the sense of belonging for everyone who comes for work or study. And this is a, a change, a very strong shift that as you can see from this timetable has been launched in this Last year, so I don't want to, to take more time in, in case we, we come over to all these numbers afterwards. I just would like to conclude with another aspect, that is the aspect of employment, that is the aspect of what they do after they finish. So it, it, it's not a matter of us to, to know what they are doing at the end of the university studies, but of course, also at international levels, what we are speaking more and more, and we have seen before, is to try to connect right now our students in the world and in the world of companies, in the world of innovation, and to put together research and innovation and education in the same ecosystems. Uh, this is the example that we are building in Milano, the new university campus in MINE. MINE means uh, Milan Innovation District and is building in the area of uh, uh, in the area of Expo, where Expo 2015. This is one of the biggest examples of urban regeneration where the university, we moved all the life science departments there, where university is in, embedded in an ecosystem, as I told you before, with, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, companies with uh, the human technical process that is a, a research center with a hospital uh, with uh, incubators of startups but also with uh, um, organization of the third sector organization of civil society so this hub that is linked with similar hubs in the world at least in Europe to start and to create uh, uh, not only innovation research, but also students embedded in, in, a, in, a, in a new, new way of uh, uh, study and international linked with other students that, of course, uh, in this field uh, uh, need to be always connected. So I, I would like to stop here and I thank you very much for, for your uh, to, to listen to me, and I would like to conclude with two sentences. One is 2017, the other is from the Council recommendations. The university of the future will derive its right to exist primarily from being active in the world and by producing knowledge for the world. And we, for to do that at European level, we need modern transnational campuses with easy access to mobility abroad to allow for a truly European study path and experience. And we stand ready to join forces with the member state and higher education institute across Europe and beyond. Thank you very much. And now I try to interrupt the presentation. Okay, great. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Valdi, to, to join us even if virtually next time we are waiting for you here in Padova in person, hopefully. And now I'm leaving the floor in order to open the discussion to Professor uh, Claudia Padovani, who in kindly asked to, to, to join us here. Uh, Claudia Padovani is Associate Professor in Political Science and International Relations at the University of Padova. This is for you. <laughs> 
her main area of interest concerned the transformation of political processes in global, the global context and their connection to the evolution of communication processes mm -hmm. and technologies. But she is first and foremost the coordinator of Scholars at Risk in Italy together with Francesca Helm, I guess. And we're very happy that we you will start the discussion. So I leave you immediately the floor. Stay working. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Valentine. Thank you to the previous speakers. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, it's a bit challenging because by listening to all these presentation and the richness of activities and the different testimonies, uh, I would actually have so much to say, uh, but I will confine maybe my comments uh, to a few points that would pick up on different key terms that I have heard in the presentation. Uh, from Professor Baldi, this whole point of partnership and networking, uh, issues of prepa being prepared or unexpected crises have been mentioned, and then a few others. Uh, before uh, entering my comments, uh, I would like to uh, say a few things uh, about my position in here. So as uh, Valentine said, I'm, uh, I'm uh, one of the reference person for scholars at risk here at the University of Padova, together with my colleague Francesca Helm, who is in the room, I'm really pleased. Uh, Francesca and I, together with Esther Gallo, we have been coordinating the Italian SAR section uh, since 2019. The section was launched in this very university. Um, and at the time, so a few years ago, uh, there were 14 universities uh, participating. The section has grown over the few years uh, to 33 universities nowadays, many of which uh, have actually expressed their interest and then entered the network uh, in the aftermath of the Afghan and Ukraine crisis. So we see what crisis bring. Crisis bring universities and institutions to maybe look for those contexts where they can find more information, more resources, more capacity, know-how on how to deal uh, with the crisis. And just to say a few words about Scholars at Risk, I will use the acronym for short, uh, uh, SAR, uh, for those who may not be familiar with the network, it has been mentioned several times, so it, it's good to see that this is part of the context in the Italian um, academic uh, uh, reality that we're talking about. SAR is an international organization, a non-governmental organization that was established in the year 2000. It works across uh, uh, more than 41 countries uh, and it involves uh, over 500 uh, university and research centers. So it's a global network that in recent terms, uh, in recent time uh, um, has organized itself more and more in national sections. So we have sections, uh, Italy was one of the newest. Uh, we now have also Greece and Flanders, uh, but we have sections in Germany, in Sweden, in Canada, in the US, uh, in many other places. And Scholars at Risk works uh, primarily to provide conditions for hosting and protection of scholars, uh, women and men who are no longer able to operate in their countries, so they find themselves uh, in forced mobility and in exile. But it also works uh, on two other pillars that I would like to bring to the fore, uh, because I think that we have heard a lot about how to respond to crisis by opening up the doors of our universities. But this, of course, needs to be done also with other activities, uh, which are so important to make this uh, uh, safe heavens uh, meaningful not only to the hosted scholars, but also to the communities that are hosting. So Scholars at Risk works for protection. It works in doing advocacy for academic freedom. So really helping different communities, uh, including students uh, and uh, administrative staff uh, and the governance people to really understand and appreciate uh, what it means to operate for academic freedom. And then it also works uh, uh, to disseminate uh, and and make new knowledge about this. And it does so through a different, uh, to a set of different instruments, including monitoring projects, including here, maybe I can mention and invite you to look up this yearly report, uh, which is published, it's titled Free to Think Report. The latest the version is the one that was just published. And this is the result of a monitoring project that is an ongoing exercise whereby hundreds of attacks to academic freedom around the world are reported on an yearly basis so as to help us understand what do we mean when we're talking about crisis of uh, fundamental values for the university. So I'm saying this uh, 
uh, to give a sense of where I am uh, speaking from today. And today in particular, I'm also speaking from, uh, from the position of somebody who've just come back last night from two days event in Berlin, where we had the opportunity as a SAR International, SAR Europe, different sections and the Inspire Europe uh, uh, project that is funded by Marie Curie. Uh, to meet together with different stakeholders and spend two days discussing what is going on in our universities and in our countries in response to this crisis. So lots of discussion that were very relevant to us, lots of food for thought. I would like to share maybe some of those uh, lessons uh, with this group so that we can include uh, and, and integrate the lessons that have been highlighted. So maybe I can start from... Uh, uh, from uh, you know, the, the approach that was taken by Professor Baldi, she was referring to the uh, European strategy for university. So she pointed out to a specific document that has been adopted a few years ago to establish the foundations of what a strategy for universities uh, could be. And that is a document where we also have a dedicated session to academic freedom, which talks about the protection and promotion of uh, European democracy values, academic freedom, and institutional autonomy. And I'm stressing some of the concepts because we will see how these are interconnected and very relevant one to the other. Now, a few years before the university strategy, uh, the ministerial conference on uh, EU research area in October 2020 adopted some, a document that is known as the Bonn Declaration on Freedom of Scientific Research. So we see that a couple of years ago, we start to witness, uh, this, this is not something completely new, but starting 2019, 2020, we started witnessing the flourishing of a number of documents, declarations, statement, positions, recommendation by European and university institution, all of which have addressed fundamental values of university and academic freedom as an issue which is now been seriously taken as a priority at the European level. And this is meaning something. This is before Ukraine, it's before Afghanistan, it's even before COVID. So this means that when we're talking about the crisis today, we really need to contextualize uh, those crises in a critical context uh, that was already becoming you know, present uh, to the European institutions. Uh, whereby the response was, uh, we need to reestablish these principles, we need to reaffirm them in a very uh, precise and clear manner. So academic freedom and freedom of research, mobility, being free to ask a proper question, be free to share your knowledge, be free to, to express yourself, both as scholars and as students within the academic community. Uh, on the same year, Council of Europe adopts uh, a recommendation uh, that titled Threat, Threats to Academic Freedom and Autonomy of Higher Education Institutions in Europe. So here we're talking about something that was, uh, that was uh, becoming visible because it was happening in Europe. It was about what was going on in Hungary, preventing from teaching some subjects, uh, closing some of the universities, Central European University forced to move to Vienna, uh, something that we've witnessed going on in Poland. Poland is now at the forefront of hosting thousands of scholars and thousands, uh, hundreds, thousands of students. Uh, uh, Professor Markozzi was referring to the 5 million people fleeing from Ukraine, but we are witnessing drops of this. Uh, I mean, many, ma the ma great majority of them is now being hosted by Polish institutions who were in Berlin and they talked to us describing how they are making sense uh, and facing this crisis uh, in the context of few weeks to be able to, um, to welcome. So we see documents uh, specifically addressing some of the higher values, uh, which is not just academic freedom, but it's institutional autonomy, social responsibility, um, equal, equitable access. Mm -hmm. So we should keep these elements uh, combined together because whatever response we give to a crisis, that response need to be consistent with the principles and values that have been established a long time ago for European universities, centuries ago in this very place. Now we want this university to live up to its commitment for the next 800, <laughs> maybe years. Um, but the other thing that I would like to point out is uh, in the course of just 
two, three years, uh, what we've witnessed uh, is already a shift. And here again, Professor Baldi was talking about the shift in the meaning of partnership. I would say we are also witnessing a shift in the very frame, in the framing that is used by European and international institutions when they deal with academic freedom. So if 2020, the Bonn Declaration was very much about defining academic freedom and establishing the principle whereby our universities should be safe haven for students and scholars. So that's the principle level. The kind of documents that we're witnessing right now, including the March 22 Ministerial Conference on Research and Innovation just held in Marseille. We now have a Marseille declaration that was adopted with nine principles and values and of course action. The March 2022 G7 plus partner Berlin declaration on international academic cooperation amidst a world of crisis. So what we see is that the shift is from affirming the principles to establishing some of the mechanisms that are needed in order to, as Professor Campanero was saying, be coherent between principle and action and move from the principle to the action. So what's very relevant to us is, for instance, that the latest Council of the European Union, and you see that I'm, I'm referring to different institutions, both from the European Union itself, and then Council of Europe, and then G7, and then several other institutions, all of which are concerned with the reality of academic freedom. But what we're witnessing today is calls for higher education institutions and government to create the conditions to be able to live and implement those principles. And I'm going to say something about what these conditions are, uh, taking advantage of the, of the stage that maybe uh, Valentine gave to me. So I will respond to some of the comments, but actually taking this opportunity, having some of the vice uh, rectors for international relation from prominent uh, Italian universities uh, to indicate some of the pathways uh, that SAR Italy and SAR International are uh, heading towards, uh, so maybe uh, put a, foot, a, more, uh, a few more elements uh, for thoughts uh, and discussion. Um, so the, the first point, and here I'm really reporting, it's my own reading of what we've discussed over the last couple of days uh, uh, in relation to the discussion we're having this morning. Lessons learned. So the critical times, as I said, we locate this in a broader context of critical time whereby academic freedom needs to be strictly connected to our experience of democracy and challenges and threats of de-democratization that we're witnessing across the world, not far from Europe. So this is the broader context, which I guess has a lot to do with the theme of this, uh, of this uh, spring school. Um, of course, uh, uh, you know, the, then we have explosion of crisis. And what does the explosion mean for an association like Scholars at Risk and thereby for the university institutions? So just to give you a sense, because sometimes numbers are meaningful in that respect, uh, Scholars at Risk normally receives application by scholars uh, who apply in order to have the possibility to be hosted in some, organ in some institution. Normally the number of application over the year has been around 500, which already is very high. And we know from the past years, uh, from Turkey, from Yemen, from Venezuela, from uh, Egypt, uh, from Iran, from China, from very different countries, right? So the Afghan crisis explodes uh, and over the course of two months, uh, scholar at risk received uh, 1,500 application to deal with. So it's not just the number that comes in, but it's the kind of operation that is required of anyone who's taking the, um, the responsibility of uh, certificating the real situation, what uh, Rafaela was saying before. These are people, individuals with their lives, their needs, their families, uh, uh, very often coming to our countries after having experienced some tragic events, maybe the loss of, uh, of friends or family members, uh, certainly the loss of a whole academic community. So the challenges for them are really huge. Uh, and what does it mean uh, to welcome and host uh, is an open issue for all of us. So what I'm saying here is, of course, the explosion of a crisis uh, somehow helped the entire academic community to give a very strong answer uh, in a fast, immediate manner the best way we could, but that needs to be, again, contextualized in a context of crises that are ongoing. 
So if we have a response for Ukraine, which is what the European Commission is now doing. So there is now, it has been announced yesterday, a Marie Curie program dedicated to scholars from Ukraine, which is fundamental, but it's actually dedicated to scholars from Ukraine. Now, in our context, uh, we know that some of the Ukrainian scholars, they don't want to leave the country. Uh, there is a concern from the institution that this may lead to brain drain. And there are concerns by the scholars themselves that they may not be willing to leave the country. So we are opening positions and sometimes we don't see as many requests and application to fill in those positions. So why not just consider that if a university is willing to host somebody, it may be somebody from Ukraine or Afghanistan or Yemen or Turkey or Egypt or Iran. University of Padova was, uh, in a sense, uh, lucky enough uh, to, be at the, uh, to be part of this beginning of uh, Scholars at Risk, uh, also thanks to the fact that uh, the department we come from has been hosting. So we've had different experiences. Uh, the first hosted scholars were from Turkey, second from Iran, the third one from Afghanistan. Completely different situation, completely different people from different research fields, uh, different challenges for us. But let's, that leads me also to one of the comments that was made in terms of our roles. Uh, so these are all elements of what's the role of university. If we look at universities from, from the value side and living up to the values. Uh, so I will come to the preparedness and networking, but I think maybe when, when it comes to our own universities, it's our department, it's our small circle of uh, colleagues. Uh, we may discuss, we have resources, we want to host and invite somebody. And then we need to take into consideration the fundamental role of mentors. Raffaella Campaner was saying, we find ourselves in a situation we've, we've not been prepared to because we haven't been trained to do this. We haven't been trained to be mentors. And when you're hosting somebody in such a fragile situation, as it was mentioned, these people may need a kind of administrative mentor, navigate through a system that is totally new for them. They may need a scientific mentor. How do you rebuild your career? How do you replan and create connections so that you can still move on with your research? You may need a social mentor. We've been involving students in doing so because often you're hosted at the department, but you know no one. And so you don't know how to navigate the city. You don't know how to navigate the relation. So the commitment that when it comes to hosting for both students and scholar becomes such a, such a relevant commitment. But that takes me to maybe a broader issue. So it has been said, were these crises expected? Question mark. They could have been, they should have been, even if they were not been, if they were not expected, we should have been prepared. And here I'm coming to some of the lessons that we've really learned from being part of an international network. What we've witnessed is that in countries where there are national programs in place with scholarships for scholars and students in some cases, those were the situation where the most effective response to the crisis uh, could be given. These are, uh, we can count them on our hands uh, because there is not much of these programs uh, uh, across Europe. There is an effective program in France, it's called POSE, uh, dates back to 2016. There is a program in, in Germany, uh, it's the Philipp Schwarz in Initiative, dates back 2015. So when were these uh, programs established with the Syrian crisis? So you see that the crisis always brings to some, uh, something which is uh, a response. But how you structure that response, uh, that is uh, the core issue. There is a long-standing program in the UK. It's called CARA for assistance of at-risk scholar, dates back to the 30s, when all the Jewish uh, uh, scholars uh, were fleeing Germany and then some going to the UK and some going to the US and contributed immensely to those academic communities. That will take me to maybe another comment. Uh, so we look at these programs that exist. Uh, SAR Italy has actually tried, uh, we are in a conversation with the conference rectors and with the Ministry of University to establish a similar program. And so here is my call to the colleague to support this request both in the rector's conference and with the ministry, because I think this is really something that is needed. The next crisis, we don't know when it's going to happen, but it will be with us at some point. 
What is characteristic of these programs is uh, the partnership and networking. So much of what has been said uh, by all the speakers uh, and the kind of relation and the collaboration and how we build on this, uh, if this is to be systematized uh, so as to have a national program that really requires uh, different stakeholders with different roles to come together. The first, of course, is Ministry of University, yes, but we have visa issue, so Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we have permits of stay issue, so that's the Ministry of Interior. So the French program, for instance, is an amazing example of how the collaboration between the different ministries with different capacities, how that has been done. And what happened with the Afghan crisis when people were running to the airport of Kabul in order to take maybe the latest flights, we learned that the French foreign ministry was able to get people out of the country after August 15. So if you have a system in place and the system is working, you can face the crisis, maybe not abandoning people that we are now providing with scholarship and we don't even know if they will be able to leave Afghanistan, right? So uh, some of the institutions are core. Universities, of course, are core. We are the knowledge community, the academic community. Uh, funding agencies, of course, every country has uh, their own uh, resources. Uh, we don't have an, a tradition of foundation, maybe like in the US and maybe like in Germany. But of course, uh, there are uh, uh, different uh, actors uh, to which we could actually refer. And the other thing that we feel is fundamental is to involve uh, the students uh, in all these activities. Um, so I said, uh, being prepared, uh, network in a very systematic manner. And then uh, the other thing that has come very prominent from the meeting we had is how do we involve and make sense of the voices of scholars that are being hosted, have been hosted, and how they can contribute to us doing a better job. And we have now learned a lot that, of course, uh, what we do is, yes, in solidarity, so academics for peace, academic in solidarity, academics in exile, we have lots of our organization and networks. Uh, but then, of course, uh, it is the academics themselves uh, who are enriching our communities. They may bring knowledges, understanding of a specific situation. We are currently hosting at Speedy Department an Afghani scholar uh, who is a legal scholar uh, working on human rights. And he's been giving seminars on different aspects of human rights in Afghanistan. Women and children situation, the freedom of expression, the history of the constitutional development. So many of these things are, you know, topics uh, that uh, may be very little known within the university, and certainly not known uh, with the lived uh, experience of somebody who's been uh, socialized uh, in that context. So we can see this kind of enriching element that comes with us, how they contribute how we transfer uh, uh, knowledge. And here, it, I think it's very interesting, this point that was made in the connection between excellence and inclusion. So we are, of course, always uh, heading for excellence. In many of the cases that we're dealing with, we are talking about, in some cases, excellent scholars. In other cases, scholars like ourselves. So how do we, associ how do we assess their capacity, uh, their curricula, their publication? They may have been publishing in Dari or in Farsi or maybe in Arabic for most of their lives. Maybe their work is also well known through you know, magazines and journal and, uh, and newspapers because these are public figures. That has nothing to do with the kind of criteria that we would be using uh, to assess uh, uh, some of the scholars in our uh, Western context. So keeping all that open in mind, I think, is helping us uh, to really uh, you know, face the situation by looking at these uh, different uh, different elements. So I want to conclude because I'm already stealing too much time. I'm sorry about this, but just uh, so two things I would like to say. Uh, SAR Italy has done something which is uh, we believe uh, some things are useful to the university um, community. Uh, one of the things was to produce uh, evademecum, so guidelines on how to host, building on the experiences. Uh, uh, if any university or department is interested in doing this and maybe they don't have that experience, now we have at least a, a little tool which is available addressing different aspects, the administration and the mentoring. Uh, we've been exchanging a lot among the universities. We, we have WhatsApp groups plus. <laughs> so of course we have working groups on uh, lobbying and outreach, on advocacy, on communication. We've done advocacy activities, particularly with the support of students. So we run advocacy seminars. Uh, 
Uh, and actually last year in June, one of the first event uh, opening up again after the COVID was the first uh, advocacy day that was held uh, in, the, in the ancient courtyard of this university. For a whole day, we were talking about cases of uh, scholars in prison. Ahmad Reza Jalali, Patrick Zaki. So again, the connection between our universities are uh, prominent. Now, in this case, I think the, the, the major call that, uh, that I would like to repeat is really that we need to work towards uh, a national program of scholarship. We are working uh, with the ministry to provide scholarship to scholars. We are also connecting with the European Student Union to develop an, a program for uh, students. So be prepared to host in the proper manner when the crisis uh, emerge, taking advantage and building and learning from the other experiences. And then the last point is um, an invitation, a very welcome, warm invitation in the context of the 800 years of the university. University of Padova is organizing a, an international conference on academic freedom. It's titled Libertas, Spaces and Practices of Academic Freedom. Uh, to be held here in uh, Padova at Beato Pellegrino on June 23rd and 24th. And we will have uh, members of European institutions, we will have scholars to share and tell their stories, we will have the students uh, talking about their experiences uh, with the seminars, but of course uh, the whole academic community is very welcome. And I thank Valentine, and sorry if I took a bit more time. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Padovani. Sorry, I'm very sorry that I have to play this very bad role in maintaining the timing <laughs> of the round table. But I would like to, to, to give some time also for some questions maybe from the public. I think just to summarize very, very briefly what has been said today is very hard indeed, but I would like to focus on a couple of points. So the first one that I think that is shared among the colleagues is that the support uh, must not be okay, occasional. So what we have to be, we have to be prepared and build prepared and build permanent infrastructures uh, and is a kind of, you know, uh, dogma in the crisis management literature. So that's why in, in any case about terrorism, migration, any case of, you know, international transnational crisis need uh, a permanent infrastructure and a permanent um, uh, yeah, the development uh, in uh, with that regard. And the second element is that, um, so Rafaela Campanera asked what the university is for. This is a very, very important uh, question. I think that as Antonella Baldi said, we have to be active in the world. So generally speaking, historically speaking, university play a very important role uh, dealing with uh, cultural diplomacy. Um, now, I think that the crisis development in the most recent, recent years, um, you know, push us to understand if the university would like to play just a cultural role or maybe broadly speaking, a more political role uh, on the international scenario. And just to be quite provocative, I'm asking to myself and to my colleagues if, if the you know, the cultural university diplomacy could go beyond what the government traditional general foreign policy, policy paths um, um, develop in, in, the, in, the, in, the for, in the next, in the next uh, years. Um, and we have already a, a question uh, from the public from home. So I'm going to read this question and maybe we can uh, collect some questions before um, having another uh, time for answers. Uh, so the question is, considering the, important, the importance of the right of education, I would like to know if the universities are trying to help in particular Afghan women to expatriate to continue their university studies. On the other hand, I wonder if Ukrainian men are encouraged to leave their country instead of fighting to follow their studies. These two situations are the opposite since in Afghanistan universities are forbidden to women and in Ukraine men used to stay there while women flee if possible because they must fight on their homelands. Thank you for the question. So maybe we can collect some comments. Yes, please. Um, maybe we have a mic there. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, it's a question for all uh, the professor and vice rectors. Uh, we talked about uh, how, new, how universities have helped uh, people during uh, crisis. What did they do instead from the point of view of the educational mission? For example, uh, to fight uh, fake news about COVID or uh, the war in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Yes, please. Um, it's more than a question. It's like um, a comment on what was said. Um, especially uh, Prof. Marcozzi touched the point is that there is there are many things to um, improve in Italy uh, regarding to the actual situation of Italian and not students here in Padua, in Rome and in Milan, I think everywhere in Italy uh, regarding to the scholarship opportunities, which are really limited and also the problem with um, finding a, a room to rent and all this stuff. So I, I think it's, um, it's appreciated that the universities are um, leaving, like not leaving, um, like giving the funds to, um, to help the Ukrainian and also Afghan students. But I think uh, the importance uh, to some point has to be given, the pro priority has to be given to students which are here present. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful presentations and contributions. Actually, my question or comment was more related to the theme of academic freedom and the Magna Carta that was mentioned before, in particular in the light of uh, the assertiveness uh, of certain non-democratic countries uh, and uh, the cultural rise, for example, of China. I'm talking about that because that my uh, research uh, interest uh, area and uh, yeah I was wondering actually if that is perceived as a challenge or more as a threat or crisis a potential crisis situation and how is uh, uh, China's cultural rise and China's uh, uh, cultural projection uh, foreshadowing uh, uh, to a certain extent uh, a European system, distinct system with Chinese characteristics. So how is that perceived in particular by the Italian university? And uh, uh, which are the responses that you uh, expect to, to implement? Thank you very much. In particular, also related to Confucius Institute presence, for example, in universities, uh, and uh, that Italy actually presents a positive trend in these regards compared to other European countries uh, in which this has been like largely discussed. So uh, in Italy, actually, there is like a counter uh, trend, I would say. So it's particular. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other question from the audience here? I think what you have, you need one month to answer to all these issues. If you don't mind, I will start with Professor Baldi. Um, yes, <laughs> I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. I, I think that all these questions uh, are deserve uh, some, uh, some time to answer because are very in depth. Uh, I would start to. Uh, to answer a little bit about uh, the um, one of the question about uh, uh, I would say science diplomacies and especially fake news because uh, these are quite related. Uh, of course, we are embedded. Uh, uh, this is the bad and the good about uh, this uh, uh, tremendous and global uh, digitalization, digitalization of information. So of course, we have access to some a lot of informations. We are at the same time in the middle of continuous fake news. So uh, the knowledge is available in the cloud, but we have to discriminate. And I think that in the future, more and more, our mission as a university is to give uh, the tools uh, to, uh, uh, to our students uh, to find the, the sources of, uh, of this kind of information. So knowledge, uh, when, when we speak of science, knowledge, diplomacy, is think that we have to create, our students must become the ambassadors of this uh, more in-depth uh, uh, capability to, to, to critically understand the differences among uh, these, these uh, uh, foggy information that we are uh, inside. 
So uh, students are also overwhelmed, overwhelmed you know, with the amount of knowledge, knowledge that also changes rapidly. So we have to give them the tools more than the information. We have already a lot of information we need to, to speak about the tools. Uh, then about uh, the last question on academic figure. Well, yesterday I was not able to attend, but I knew that in Magna Carta there was a, a two or three hours of webinars on, on this aspect. And this is again and again in the agenda uh, as, uh, as is also is frequently said during this, uh, this morning. Uh, about China, of course, um, I, in Liru, since I have in the University of Milan attend to the League of European Research University, we see that some country, Northern country especially, has designed it to forbid the entering of Chinese PhD students. They are discussing about that. So that is not the position of our, at least our university. But at the same time, yes, it's a problem of security, but we have also a problem larger that is the cyber security. So we are not all, only to, to take care of eventually presenters of China's students in our university, the problem is quite larger. So it's not only related to to take care, of course, that we must about uh, our data, but also is a more general problem. Then the last question is about the priority to students present. And I don't understand if they're uh, international student or Italian students. So I, I cannot discriminate. Of course, in the case of Ukraine, for instance, we took care first of our 250 students that were already in our university for sure. And of course, then we open also to to the other university. We have 200 requests of fellowship which arrived from uh, Ukrainian, but also non-Ukraine students but which study in Ukraine, especially medical school, we are overwhelmed from a request of, uh, uh, to be transfer, of, um, transferred to, to our university from uh, students, not, not Ukraine students, but they were students in Ukraine. So this is another problem as well. Thank you so much, Antonella. So maybe I can pass uh, the word to uh, Cristina Basso. Uh, they are very difficult question, uh, not easy to, to answer. I can start from my field because I feel uh, quite uh, embarrassed sometimes during the, the, I felt embarrassed during COVID pandemic due to the communication uh, about uh, science uh, rules and so on. Particularly in part, I must confess there are very famous uh, speaker about the problem of COVID infection, so on. So at that time I was involved uh, um, by the previous rector to write uh, the code, the, the document for integrity in research. And due to this problem, we introduced a comma about communication and freedom of communication. There was a big debate, not easy to find a solution because uh, where is the border between the freedom of the researcher to communicate and uh, then uh, this researcher is speaking on behalf of the university or on behalf of him or himself it's not easy really to to find the the, the right answer um, so the final uh, decision was uh, to to say uh, every communication should be balanced uh, and you should always specify whether you are speaking on behalf uh, of your institution or just as a personal perspective. I think that this is the, the only possibility uh, right now. Uh, this is not just for COVID, but for many other instances. Um, for instance, here I'm, I'm speaking, but uh, I'm uh, reporting the, what the University of Padua is believing, or is just my personal perspective when, uh, of course, I am replying to this question. Uh, Afghanistan, for sure, this is the uh, university perspective. When uh, there was the uh, call for uh, um, uh, University for Afghanistan, uh, the rector decided to have 50 50 for women and men to ensure that women were coming from Afghanistan because the priority, of course, uh, uh, the, the, of the emergency in that country this is not the same for Ukraine, but at the end of the story, most were women arriving due to the reason that you know. But I would like also to introduce a, an aspect that probably was not stressed um, uh, too much. Uh, the, there is a, a deep difference between Afghanistan 
uh, seeker for to study in Padua and uh, Ukrainian one. Uh, the feeling that we have is also for scholar that the Ukrainians are just um, transient. They want to go back to their country. And probably our task in the next months or, or years will be to help them to reconstruct because they want to go back to their country as citizens, as students, as scholars, and to start again. So one of the mission, for instance, of the alliance that uh, were mentioned by our colleague from Milan, uh, European Alliance is to help this university in Ukraine to, to become member of these uh, networks and to, to start again to live and to research, to study, to teach. So uh, probably the perspectives are totally different. Um, housing is a big problem <laughs> here in Padua. We discussed a lot. Uh, it's not just a problem for uh, people coming from abroad, students coming from abroad, international, but also for Italian students coming from different region, far away. So is uh, in fact, we have some complaint from Italian student, why you are helping first the international and then the other one. I mean, uh, is a general problem. Uh, of course, uh, uh, long term, the University of Padua is planning to have a new housing facilities, uh, but we need something for the next academic year, not uh, in a three, four years. Uh, uh, of course, projection. So we're moving this, in this direction. Uh, a, a, back to the discussion about uh, to maintain or not uh, um, dual uh, lesson teaching. For instance, there was a discussion whether for international courses to maintain the first semester to also due to this problem of accommodation housing, um, a dual uh, teaching. So many discussion, probably the same. Uh, in, uh, in our universities, uh, people against, uh, people uh, in favor or to maintain uh, this kind of uh, teaching. So, um, not easy for sure. Thank you. Uh, Raffaella Campanel. I will just try to add something to what has been said so far. So, with respect to Af uh, women from Afghanistan and men from Ukraine. Uh, in, in Bologna, we didn't put any sort of restriction one, one way or, or another. At some point, though, we devoted a uh, given amount of money, and Claudia, is, I think, is, a, is aware of that, just for women coming from uh, Afghanistan. But we had a really hard time in terms of getting the, the visas, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd like to mention this short story, just not, not to sound harsh, but just I think everybody needs to be very aware that these things are great and we're really committed, but they are also very, very tough. At some point, there were roughly 50 women in uh, Greece. Please uh, correct me if I'm uh, wrong. Uh, different universities were trying to have a few of them. We were ready to have four of them in, in Bologna. They had accepted to come with four fellowships meant for women from Afghanistan. They, had, they all had a background in legal studies. Um, at some point, Canada, the, the, the government from Canada said, we're going to take them all. So all the visas were for all of them. And obviously, although they were reluctant and some of them were really willing to stay in, in Europe, it was, I think, wise. It, it made sense for them just to leave the country and go all together in, in, in Canada. So sometimes the, the efforts we put are really huge. But then I, I really uh, agree with, with uh, Claudia, we need to do some sort of to, to put some extra efforts in interactions with the ministry uh, in order to make processes smoother. Also, because when you are, there is something which, which hasn't maybe been stressed enough. Um, when you are the subject within a crisis, you want things to happen quickly. I mean, you are suffering, so you cannot wait for the long kind of uh, time interval, uh, um, so time is a, is a, is a crucial thing. Uh, with respect to men from Ukraine, we didn't put any restriction on the, on the fellowships and scholarships and visiting staff. We are receiving more requests from women than from men. But at the same time, the last couple of weeks, we also got a couple of emails from male uh, colleagues in Ukraine telling us, I don't know whether it is going to work or not, that were they to receive some letters of acceptance from the university saying that they're going to have some, even if temporary position, then that's going to increase their chances to leave the country. So I don't know whether this is going to work, but we wrote the couple of letters and then, and then we'll see. With respect to priorities and, and, and students, this is 
I think a very important problem because um, especially for universities like all well, ours are, especially for universities in which we have such a huge number of student, um, students, students might be facing difficult situations even if they're not from Afghanistan, if they're, even if they're not from Ukraine. So we did make choices in the last few months and we did favor in a sense, we, we, we need to recognize this, some uh, citizenships uh, with, with respect to, to others. Uh, this has been done for a number, I think, of very good reasons. What we are doing in Bologna also because of the reflections that students, which are, I think, and I think rightly so, quite opinionated on, on this matter, they, they told us there are many more students who are in need of help than the ones that you are helping. And we're taking this seriously. So the next calls are just meant to be for any students whatsoever in need, irrespective of any nationality for, for a few months now. Um, China and the Magna Carta. So this, this will take forever. The colleague who actually gave the paper yesterday is a very good friend of mine. She's uh, Maria Kronfeldner. I'm a philosopher of science. She's a philosopher of science. We've met before because we've been in the steering committee of the European Philosophy of Science Association. And from, for some years, we run a program to get PhD students as, from Eastern Europe as scholars in, in Western Europe. Uh, Maria was... Just, just, just to, to mention a very specific example, Maria was a prof I mean, is a professor at the CEU. She was working in Hungary. She was loving it there, and she was forced to leave. And she's now in, in Vienna for obvious reasons. So she has a pretty um, strong and, and, and close point of view. The debate on what attitude we should have, what attitudes we should have with respect to countries such as Yemen, Saudi Arabia. Uh, China. So the, the, if you start counting them, actually, you realize that there's quite a few. Um, within the Magna Carta is a very hot topic. I had my first meeting with the Magna Carta as a vice rector in March, and quite some time was spent on, on this. So the general attitude is, as academic institutions, we need to be open to dialogue, and we want to do so. If not universities, who is going to keep the dialogue open with scholars in those countries. If we believe that our values are to be shared and, and, and promoted, this is going to happen throughout the dialogue. There's, there's, no, there's no other way. So we, are, we need to be extremely careful in terms of financial things which happen or sharing of, of sensitive information, dual use, cybersecurity and all of that. But we don't think that relations should be shut down. Um, so the Magna Carta is constantly thinking and rethinking also because the Magna Carta constant, I mean, I think the, we, are, we are up to 951 universities uh, signing. We are, we, have, we are having the signing ceremony in September, 14th and 15th of September in, in Bologna. It's going to be a huge event. The Magna Carta is constantly receiving uh, requests to, to sign. So therefore, there is an evaluation committee which runs through. And we think that in, 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 in many cases, those universities are actually asking for help to embrace the values we believe in. And so the, the Confucio Institute uh, in Bologna, it was, um, the, the agreement was, fine, was signed in 2009, I'm, I'm told. And so far, they are, they are, I met the director a few days ago. Uh, they just promoted courses of Chinese in the schools in Bologna and in the, in the region. So again, it is meant as the promotion of Chinese culture. It is a very sensitive topic these days and we are aware. I had a, at the very beginning of my, of my mandate and then I, I stopped it there, I had a very sort of surprising for me conversation with the consul from the USA who visited me in uh, Bologna and I, I know she did the same in other cities around Italy asking, uh, what, what is going on within the Confucian Institutes. So the, there is some sensitivity there, which goes far above what we believe are kind of academic standard cultural. I mean, the, the Confucian Institute in Bologna delivers courses of Chinese. Uh, they, they, they even now and then promote some events having to do with Chinese film festivals, stuff like that. And I, I must say, I was, I was very surprised. Um, they are afraid 
um, that through the Confucian Institutes, all the things happen in terms of industrial firms related things. We were very kind of serene and, and we were surprised um, and we were very serene in saying our collaboration, our scientific collaboration is going to continue along the same lines in which it has been uh, carried out in the last years. Thank you so much. Um, Marcuzzi. A few remarks. Uh, thank you for the questions and for the opportunity to say something else again uh, about uh, different topics. The first one is the first answer. Uh, first this topic to discuss for me is that of the fighting the fake news. Uh, th th this is um, really a, um, a short answer. Our daily work is to, our daily work as scholars is if not to find the truth, at least to approximate to the truth. So all the scientific thought of the modernity comes out from the philology of the Renaissance. So our work against the untruth, it's on a daily basis. And what we try to deal with in our daily work is to teach our students to have the means to critically recognize what is true and what is not true and what is dealing with sources, the, the work that uh, philologists, those with texts, they have to do it with other kind of texts, the texts that they deal with every day. About uh, the second point, it's the limited uh, resources that we have for students, and we don't want to create a riot uh, and uh, to satisfy, I mean, all our students applying for a sort of, for a form of shelter and protection from other countries, they are in, in a condition of need. So we don't, we, we, we cannot create, um, I mean, a war among people in condition of needs. Uh, the, the very problem is that, that this uh, topic is not in our power. Universities cannot do so much about this. And sometimes it's uh, the number of refugees exceeds largely the the possibilities that universities have. So the unique solution, as Claudia said, is in improving networks among universities and between universities and stakeholders and regional um, or local or national authorities about networks and about crisis. I feel that our response to crisis it's always, uh, at least in Italy, because we heard from Claudia that in Germany and in other countries, there is not an emotive, I mean, emotional response to crisis. We are right. O obviously, crisis, um, can I say, asks us also an emotional response because we see bombings, uh, casualties, we see ruins, we see people running uh, to the last fly. Um, so the problem is that um, we didn't understand so much, for example, we didn't talk today about the Syrian crisis and we dealt with that. I remember there was a unica, unica is the network among the universities of the capital town in Europe. So Rome, Berlin, Paris, and all the other capitals. And we had uh, lots of meetings in that period also about the Syrian crisis. And we learned so much by the German and the Norwegian experience in dealing with the recognition. Many, many universities in Syria were raised down by bombings. 
by bomb droppings. So they were completely destroyed. And many people arrived to Europe without any paperwork about their, any statement about their career. They said, I'm a surgeon, I'm a historian, but nobody could prove that. So we studied along with the Norwegian and the German um, officers for immigration, how to um, reconstruct with the, the help of the web, the Wayback Machine and other information, other sources of information, how to reconstruct their career and how to validate their career. Um, it was very helpful. And the approach to that crisis was as the approach with the Turkish crisis, because there is a big crisis for academic freedom in Turkey. We, we don't talk uh, on a, about what the, 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 our colleagues in Turkey had to deal with in the last 10 years. But many of my colleagues ask me if, I mean, there are many colleagues in Turkey that we, we lost their traces. Simply, they don't work at university anymore. We had agreements with many of them and we cannot trace their career now. So the last point to address is that of the academic freedom. I mean, uh, what, uh, the, the education to this freedom. I mean, what we have to do, for example, with Turkish universities, we have to close, I, I say Turkey, but I can say Saudi Arabia, China. We have to completely close our doors or we have to try to, I mean, improve the, the little that they have about this, this, this topic. So, when we talk with a colleague, have to have we to abandon our colleague to their destiny, or we can we judge whether can we state whether or not they are compliant with the regime, or they are only trying to defend themselves and to save their lives? We cannot judge this. We only can make so that uh, their freedom uh, is improved also in the place without asking for shelter. And it's a daily little work that we need the patients to, to, to carry on and to develop every day. Thank you. Maybe Claudia, would you like to add something? It's just one minute. Um, three points uh, uh, that have been made I would like to touch upon. Just to say how we believe that in the idea of partnerships and collaboration, SAR Italy and SAR Europe can maybe help, support, uh, contribute to move forward. Uh, I think the work that, that a network like SAR does uh, is a part of cultural diplomacy. So there is a level which is that of lobbying at the European institution, for instance, every time there is a new project for a document, uh, SAR Euro provides uh, some input for the document so that academic freedom is included, so that the basic values are included. That is one element. To me, cultural diplomacy should not be understood as just something that is far and carried out by vice rectors for international relations, but it also really relates to the cultural organization in our own departments. And so what we witness uh, by the, the work that we do with scholars and with students uh, and all these activities of hosting and support is that really on a daily basis, we do see changes where administrative uh, staff uh, become more aware, uh, where uh, they learn lots of things, uh, where there, uh, there's lots of organizational change that goes on, uh, which may support uh, the kind of cultural diplomacy that the university is doing at the governance level. So I would, I would maybe keep those two levels uh, connected. As far as the fake news, it's all about knowledge, of course. Uh, and uh, what we've done as SAR, for instance, is we organize a speaker series, uh, so events uh, that are organized regularly. We've done some, something on Afghanistan, on Iran, on Belarus. Uh, we will certainly be doing something on Ukraine in the future, inviting testimonies and voices, trying to have different perspectives, including scholars and, and students. So maybe as a, it's a small piece of contribution, but maybe relevant. 
And then I think the biggest uh, uh, challenge, one of the big challenge also very interesting is this whole point of academic freedom and how that intersect uh, internationalization strategies. It has been said uh, it's part of an ongoing, uh, not easy debate uh, in some spaces. Uh, there is one um, interesting collaboration we're having recently with, uh, with the Swedish uh, section of SARA. Uh, whereby they have discussed uh, a lot more. So I would say the public debate uh, on how internationalization of universities should include concern for academic freedom uh, and how do we position ourselves in relation to other institutions. Uh, uh, they are a bit more advanced uh, than, uh, than we think we are in Italy. So in the context of that collaboration, we have invited them to the conference that I mentioned in June, precisely to address uh, some of these uh, is, of these issues. And so for us, it's interesting that maybe if it ne is a network, we can contrib contribute to ongoing debates uh, by providing some of the know-how and the knowledge and expertise that we have. And at the same time, really being part of the dialogues uh, that are ongoing, we would be maybe very, very happy to do so. Um, so of course, uh, dialogues uh, continue uh, and it's a necessity. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you to all contributors of this morning, Professor Basso, Campaner, Marcozzi, Baldo, Baldi, and also Professor uh, Padovani. I'm very happy that you accepted to share your knowledge and your experiences also with the broader audience. It was a great step um, towards uh, this, this final common aim, which is probably building up a, co a cultural diplomacy, cultural university uh, diplomacy that could help in crisis management. Also, I may say to prevent probably some crises, at least from the cultural diplomatic point of view. Okay, thank you so much again. So the dialogue will continue also this afternoon because we will have in, um, the uh, session dedicated to terrorism and crisis management at half past two. So see you soon. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here.